Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Brian Fabian Crane, and today I'm speaking with Stephen Young and Storm. Stephen is the CEO and co-founder of NiftyFi, and Storm is head of business development. NiftyFi is uh, kind of the first NFT lending platform. It's one of the leading and earliest projects in the NFT finance space. So today... We're going to talk about NFTs and NFT finance and NiftyFi and, you know, sort of like where all those things are going. Pretty excited about this, especially because I'm I'm not very deep in the NFT space. So I'm excited to learn more uh, from these two. Yeah. So thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having us, Brian. Excited to, to fill you and your readers and your listeners in on some of the happenings in NFTs, uh, even though... We're kind of in the depths of a bear market. Uh, we are all still pretty bullish on this side. Absolutely. Thanks for having us, Brian. Very excited to chat. Cool. Maybe you can just start off uh, if you guys could both introduce yourselves and share a bit like how did you, uh, you know, how has your sort of journey into crypto been and how has it led to um, NiftyFi? Yeah, sure. So, um, so my name's Steven. I've been in tech basically since I was uh, a teenager, really, learned to program. My first job was um, writing a game in C++ uh, when I was still in high school. So it really has been my career from the start. Uh, and I, I live in South Africa. Uh, I spent two years just as I finished high school living in the UK. Uh, and then around 2016, did a calculation and figured out that I was earning less in dollars uh, 15 years into my career than I was in my first job living in the UK. Uh, and that was basically because the South African rand's purchasing power had just fallen off a cliff. Uh, so I was still in South Africa, enjoyed the lifestyle, all my friends were here, but I was looking for a way to kind of escape the, the financial system here. Uh, and really that's how I kind of uh, came across crypto, uh, and then late 2016, bought uh, my first crypto, you know, basically using all, instead of paying into my retirement annuity, I was buying crypto, which is probably not the most um, <laughs> risk, uh, like management style for retirement. But really, you know, like given how badly the South African Rand was doing, uh, you really was kind of my only option to to really exit the, the system here. So that was 2016, went full-time into crypto, like 2018, uh, and then started Niftify end of uh, 2019. So basically spent the first two lockdowns in South Africa writing the first version of Niftify uh, and launched in June 2020. Uh, and then my interest in NFTs really came from the way that I actually learned to program as a kid was by doing essentially generative art using this program called Logo. It's, it's a list derivative that's essentially used to teach children how to program uh, and you do that by drawing pictures on the screen with this little turtle so you know so i was into generative arts really as soon as i got into uh, programming so when nfts came around you know combining uh, art uh, programming and then i spent most of my career working for financial for financial services companies so you know you know adding in finance on top of that and you kind of basically have niftify Awesome. And uh, thanks again. So my name is Storm. So uh, my background, I'm originally from Ireland. And um, so essentially, I kicked off my career in the investment banking space in a speciality called project finance, which is essentially infrastructure, renewable energy finance. Did that for, for quite some time, uh, around five years uh, before I really fell down the kind of crypto rabbit hole. Um, when I discovered, well, I suppose actually I've been in, in uh, crypto since 2014. I dabbled in it as a student, but at that point in time, I was more interested in, in buying beers than kind of adding to my my stack of crypto. So I discovered it at that time, like really fell in love with it. Kind of followed it very closely over the course of kind of five years. And at which point I kind of really fell down the rabbit hole, as I said, in 2021, which when I discovered NFTs. So I uh, kind of started in that space, collecting some, uh, trading some, flipping some, the usual kind of a classical NFT degenerate story. Um, and, but I did also kind of uh, begin to discover NFT finance at that point in time as well. It was quite interesting that 
not only could you buy and sell assets, but also you could be into kind of as part of your trading strategy, take loans out against them as well. So I started there as kind of a manual lender in the NFT finance space, but then uh, kind of since partnered up with a developer, a business partner developer, and we started doing a lot of automated or programmatic lending in the NFT space as well. So I really kind of uh, got very deeply involved uh, after a time, came to know all of the, essentially all of the major lenders in the space uh, and quite some of the borrowers in the space as well. And after you've been in the space for, for quite a while, you, you like it is a very, very deep rabbit hole from which you really can't emerge. And probably as we, as we continue on the conversation later today, like there's a lot of very interesting aspects of the market that are creeping up that I think are, are really going to be exciting over the next uh, couple of years. Cool. Thanks so much for these intros. Uh, so you mentioned already a little, you both kind of touched on it a bit, right? And so this is basically like the NFT market. And can you just uh, let us know, like, what is the state of the NFT market today? And maybe also just draw a little bit, yeah, the, the main things that are going on. Yeah. So maybe what I can do is give like a very high level kind of overview uh, and then Storm, maybe you can dive into a couple of things that uh, are actually can looking quite interesting uh, going forward. So, so I think there's broadly two kind of groups of NFTs that are, are active in the market uh, and I would can pro- classify them really as the top end of the art market and collectibles. Uh, and then everything else really. Uh, and in the top end of the art market, the reason I have put that differently is because I think that's really the sector of the market that has actually found product market fit. You know, so these um, art pieces are, they're finished. You know, there's no external dependencies. A lot of them are fully on chain. You're not relying on a team or a project to go build something out that's now gonna drive value to these assets. You know, they're just pieces of art, they're finished. Uh, you know, you can just, uh, everything that you need to know to evaluate them is almost in the past, right? You know the artist, you know the history, uh, the work is either good or it's not. You're not waiting for any future things. Then there's this whole second set of the market, which is more company-like or utility, you know, so I would say uh, profile, picture, projects, PFPs would fit into there. You know, a lot of the new areas around ticketing and music and royalties and all these kinds of things, they're very interesting and, you know, a lot of potential there, I think, but much more risky because they still have to prove product market fit. And that's, you're seeing it actually in the prices. If you look at the, like an index that's mainly made up of top end art, they've pretty much bottomed and not really gone down any further. Whereas if you look at PFP projects and and all of um, everything in that category, they still have a, quite a lot of headwinds ahead of them. Um, so yeah, so that's like broadly how I would put those two. Uh, I think the other thing to also just bear in mind is that you know NFTs really are a luxury good, and the same as any luxury goods, they they have the wealth effect really takes um, an impact. So if you if you look at the prices for secondhand luxury watches like Rolexes and Patek Philippe's and you overlay that graph onto the prices for uh, Bored Ape Yacht Club, it's almost a mirror of each other. I mean, the, the Bored Apes are slightly more volatile, but you know the peak was in, in March, April. They've slowly been going down since then, starting to bottom right now. Some signs that maybe in the next few months they start turning around. And it's really... Uh, these are illiquid assets that are luxury purchases. Uh, and like every other luxury asset in that class, when people feel rich, they start spending more money. When the markets turn around, these illiquid assets are the last thing you sell. So they tend to hold their prices for a little bit longer and kind of um, drop uh, after the rest of the market's actually dropped. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. Thanks, Stephen. Um, and I suppose the way that I would frame it in some ways is that the NFT market to date has been a great placeholder for what is to come probably over the next, call it one one to three years as an example. Particularly when you look at the profile picture market, which really has actually just been the lion's share of the market to date. It's kind of been a good experiment in NFTs as like a base technological primitive and how you can kind of stack that with other kind of composable um, technology structures on that sit on Ethereum. Um, like there's been kind of some good, interesting highlights 
particularly around the areas of as alongside the ones that you mentioned, Stephen, community building, membership, just general interaction with fans. Um, it's a good way for companies to release products. So it's a completely new way for them uh, to release products, which uh, you know never discount the concept of companies trying to sell uh, people at large more, more products. Um, it's a it's you know it's been an interesting way for artists in particular to express themselves. That's been a definite bright spot, like the emergence of a lot of creativity on chain. Whereas you know artists or creatives generally might not have had that outlet before. And then one important area, definitely worth mentioning, we're starting to see a lot of green shoots in the area of real world assets. So these these are physical or financial assets which are starting to make their way on chain. Um, and then just generally, as I mentioned, kind of like the concept of digital asset composability. So, like, which is a really, really important one where essentially you kind of ask the question where, how do pure digital objects or alternatively digital ob objects, which represent physical objects, how do they stack, you know, in the DeFi money Lego composable worlds that we live in on, on Ethereum. And I think like, you know, over the coming years, the, this composability of NFTs with other primitives really starts to f form like quite a significant bedrock, you know, an economic bedrock on, on Ethereum, which will be quite interesting. I'm curious if you can dive in a little bit into, yeah, the sort of real world asset bracket of the market. W what, what has most traction there? Like what kind of use cases? Yeah, so I think um, there's sections of the market that are actually very similar to the collectibles that I've already found some traction in in NFTs. So, uh, and that you know, watches, sneakers, uh, uh, paintings, basketball playing cards, those kind of things. Um, so the reason I think those will probably take off first is it's relatively easy to store those things in a warehouse and tokenize them. Uh, they are fairly unregulated, so you're not having to, to jump through a lot of regulatory hoops. They kind of act very similar to um, the actual NFTs. There's a huge overlap in the holder base. So a lot of the people who started collecting NFTs were just collectors at heart. So they already had a stamp collection or Magic the Gathering cards under their bed or multiple watches that they're collecting. So so there's there's just this um, big overlap between the actual borrower base or the, uh, the actual collector base there that I think um, uh, connects in quite easily. Uh, and then I think the the other reason is now that you're starting to have some of these NFT financialization um, services that are kind of cropping up around NFTs, tokenizing that asset all of a sudden means you can do things with it that's much more difficult to do if you don't actually take it up, tokenize it and bring it on chain. So get access to 24-7 markets, uh, you know, OpenSea, Blur, all those kind of things. You get lending markets, you get fractionalization. You know, there's a whole bunch of this infrastructure that has been built over the last two years that all of a sudden actually make it worthwhile to bring those assets on chain. So in, the, in this example, uh, let's say you mentioned like watches, sneakers and stuff. So this would, you would have an NFT and that can be redeemed then for the actual physical object, something like That's that. That's correct, yeah. So and the physical object is stored with some custodian and anyone can go there and basically give the NFT and they get the... Uh, yes, exactly. And that's kind of where we're seeing a lot of the traction at the moment. So there's quite a few people, you know, like 4K.com is basically building a distributed network of warehouses where you, you send in the physical asset, they bring it on, take some photos, maybe do a 3D scan, uh, mint an NFT that represents the assets, and then um, basically that NFT, can, the, the the actual asset stays in the warehouse, and that NFT can start trading. Uh, you know, go through OpenSea, go into a loan, and then at some point, if you, if the owner of that NFT wants to redeem the asset, they can burn that NFT, uh, and in return, the the warehouse sends it back to to that person. So in theory, uh, which is quite an interesting concept, you could become the world's largest watch, sneaker, trading card dealer without ever taking physical possession of an item, which I think will be quite interesting. And, and similarly, you can become you know a major lender in the space without ever having, having to take custody of an asset. Cool. Well, let, let's talk about NFT finance then. So, you know, you mentioned a bunch of the different types of assets 
And of course, a lot of listeners will be familiar. I think most of our listeners will be, you know, reasonably familiar with DeFi and, you know, no kind of the primitives on there. But what does the NFT finance space look like? And what are the most important, you know, kind of like primitives and innovations there? Yeah, sure. So I think there's two main distinctions that you want to make when you're considering the NFT lending market. And that is whether the protocol is a peer-to-peer model or whether it's a peer-to-pool model. I think that's the two kind of buckets into which most NFT platforms fall um, at the moment. And then, of course, you have um, structures which sit sit on top of them and leverage them. But for the most part, the building blocks of of the industry are are peer-to-peer, peer-to-pool models. The way that the, uh, I should mention, NFT Phi in this case is a peer-to-peer platform um, it's a platform, or it's a structure that we really back. Um, it's worked very well for us since the start. Has a, a, really a lot of um, excellent aspects about it that make it very borrower friendly. Um, so, just to maybe dive into what that actually looks like. Um, so, peer to peer platform, as you can imagine, is comprised of two sides. On one part, you have borrowers which come onto the platform. On the other side, you have lenders which come onto the platform. The borrowers typically own NFTs or, or various different assets, which they list um, on the platform. In this case, it's a gas-free transaction to list it on NFT5. And then lenders come onto the platform and they compete, essentially compete for the assets which they would like to lend against. Um, and so what that typically looks like, lenders set bids structured around loan-to-value of assets, around uh, the different APRs which they would like to receive in return for the loan. Um, and that's kind of t- the typical approach. The borrower will then have a look through the various different terms that have been made available to them from the various lenders, and they'll select the terms that work best for them. You know, some some lenders have a shorter time preference where they only want to loan for let's call it three or seven. Sorry, some some borrowers have a shorter time preference where they only need capital for three or seven days. Or on the other end of the market, we're actually seeing quite a lot of loans for three hundred and sixty-five days, so full full years. Um, so with that being said, at the, at the end of the term of the loan, what the borrower does, they simply, uh, it's a fixed, fixed term loan, APR is fixed at the start of the loan. So at the end of the duration of the loan, they know exactly what they have to repay and the date on which they repay. Um, at that point they repay the loan, um, which is initially placed in an escrow smart contract. The asset, or see the, the NFT is placed in an escrow smart contract. It's then released from the escrow smart contract back to the borrower at the end of the duration or at the repayment of the loan, and the lender receives back their principal plus the interest which they offered. So that's in summary uh, the the peer to peer structure. And then, so just to jump in there, if the lender the, the borrower doesn't repay on time, then the lender can foreclose the asset. The borrower keeps the the loan principal, and the lender will receive the actual NFT. Yeah, so that's basically the risk that uh, the lender has to sort of calculate with that, okay, if this NFT drops in value, then all of a sudden it can be the case that doesn't make economic sense anymore for the borrower to actually repay the loan and then they would they would sort of default even if they, let's say, normally could, you know, maybe they have the money and they could pay, right? But like... Correct, correct. And, and many... Many uh, borrowers actually use um, the protocol as part of a hedging strategy as well. So essentially to protect their downside in the instance that the value of their NF- NFTs does fall. And on the other side, many, you know, many of the lenders are very sophisticated individuals, former traditional finance individuals, and, and just generally very deep NFT finance people. So they they understand the risks for the most part of of, uh, of kind of the, the the structures there. So. Um, yeah, it's it's very interesting space, um, and then perhaps moving on then to the peer to pool model, um, which is a little bit different. It probably more closely resembles what you're used to seeing with Aave or um, kind of Balancer or one of these types of of pool models, um, where essentially on one part you have the borrowers, uh, and again you have the lenders. The lenders place into one generalized pool an amount of Ethereum or USDC as an example. And then the borrowers can retrieve Ethereum or USDC from those pools 
by depositing their assets into the into the pools. Typically, those um, terms are preset by the pool itself or by the protocol itself. For example, if you had a, a board ape at you know a floor price of thirty ETH and it had a fifty percent loan to value um, specified on the pool, you can withdraw fifteen ETH from the pool. Typically, with that approach, there is no duration set, so you can borrow indefinitely in theory. However, you do need to be conscious of essentially your health or LTV ratios in those pools. So if they fall below a certain uh, level, then there is the risk that you can have your assets liquidated. And typically as a result, the liquidated assets are placed into a, an automated auction mechanism where they're listed and people can bid on them um, and th they're liquidated that way. Whereas in the peer-to-peer -peer -peer model, it's the individual lenders themselves which carry out the liquidations. And just uh, one thing that occurs to me here, I, mean, I don't know if that's correct, but it seems like in the peer-to-peer -peer model, maybe you don't need any kind of external price oracle, but in the peer-to-peer -peer model, you would need that? Yep, that's correct. Absolutely yeah, correct. And that's one of the reasons we're, um, we really back the peer-to-peer -peer model here, just because we're already seeing it um, with a few of the the peer to pool protocols is because you have this time weighted oracle. So you need to have a time weighted oracle because these assets are pretty illiquid. So you know if you're just looking at the the immediate price, it's quite easy to move the floor price of that asset if you own enough of them. Uh, so so you have the time weighted uh, oracle, which then means big whales in the market can they know when the next price move is is coming and they can essentially position themselves because they've got you know a lot of capital and a lot of these assets to either move the the next um, uh, the, the next price that you're going to get from the oracle around or predict what it's going to be and essentially um, you know dump assets into the market just before just after uh, one of those updates are going to be so um, so I think that is a, a very key difference between the two and I think the other big thing is predictability and control for the asset owners. So, you know, if you own, you know, an autoglyph, for example, you know, there's only 512 of them, you know, they hardly ever sell. They're really hard to get the hold of once you've actually sold one. They typically only sell it when the prices are going up, when the markets are, when the prices are going down, a hold this is going to hold them. Uh, and in that scenario, you might end up as a, in a peer-to-peer -peer model, maybe there's a, there's a spike down in the price over the short term. But you still want to repay because you believe in six months it's going to recover and you know that if you sell this asset now you're not going to be able to buy it back before before the price recovers um, and in a peer-to-peer -peer model because it's fixed duration fixed interest it's you always in control you always know i need to pay this much on this date and it's my choice to decide if i do that obviously excel circumstances might mean that you can't uh, but still you're in control Whereas in these peer-to-pool models and actually on the blend model too, um, where it's variable duration, variable interest, you're exposed to market movements in that actual loan. And if there's a temporary price um, push down, your asset might get liquidated. Typically, these liquidations happen at the worst time because the market's dumping. It's probably quite illiquid. Uh, so... It's, yeah, so this is a diff different risk profile and different kind of borrower who will do each one of the two. So that, that, you know, variable interest, variable duration is probably more suitable to a trader who's trying to unlock some liquidity, maybe to ch chase some yield in another protocol somewhere. Um, and as soon as that yield um, isn't profitable anymore, you can just move the asset out of uh, out of that um, loan and you kind of um, stop your actual losses there. Whereas if you've got a fixed duration loan, you kind of locked in for that period. So you talked, uh, I mean, yeah, this, this is very helpful, interesting. So you both talked about lending, right? So the use case of lending and then, you know, this pool and P2P model. Aside from lending, are there other major, you know, uh, kind of types of DeFi? I don't know, are people trying to do like options or I don't know, is there something like perpetuals or like, I don't know, what, are, what other kinds of instruments have people come up with around NFT? Yeah, well, you've took the two concepts that you touched on there. There absolutely are um, protocols active in that space. Um, the, and the perp side in particular, um, probably it, it's, a diff it's a very difficult 
um, area. Again, it comes back oftentimes to the issue of having an oracle for what is uh, quite an illiquid asset. So there's NFT Perp as an example, which is active in that space, um, and they are in the process of revamping their protocol um, to refresh it. Um, but one of the very interesting areas, again, is you know as we're positioning ourselves and have positioned ourselves as you know a very much a base primitive within the NFT lending world, you do get interesting integrations w- with these other protocols, whereby you know they're coming to us to talk to us, hey. You guys have the best regarded um, smart contracts in the industry. You've been around for the longest, and you know we would love to work with you and build our protocol on top of you. So, as an example, we're actually in discussions with um, an NFT options platform who are, you know, going to integrate alongside us, you know, as part of that. So, uh, potentially leveraging our smart contracts and settlement layer um, as part of, you know, a, a major part of their their platform. Um, but there are a lot of innovations in the space um, so far. I think one thing that has many protocols have struggled with somewhat is just the level of liquidity in the market when you compare it to the fungible token or the URC20 token market. They typically tend to work um, a little bit better from a composability standpoint compared to NFTs, but that is something which we're seeing that's shifting. Yeah, I think the, that's a very important point. Even the most liquid NFT collection is probably less liquid than the least liquid ERC twenties, right? So they just um, they just way less active. So things like pricing is much more difficult. Um, you know, oracles are much more difficult. So there's it's just there's just some idiosyncrasies in the actual NFT market, mainly due to not to so much the fact that it's an NFT standard, but the types of assets that are suited to being represented as an NFT, by definition, are more unique. They're not fungible. They're less liquid. So they just have a different set of properties uh, that, you know, so certain products don't work as well. And there's, you know, new products that are, are kind of um, more interesting and different. And, and I think quite a bit of opportunity exists in that as well in a market that's, you know, completely non-fungible, there are areas where you can specialize and really um, kind of take advantage of, you know, from a lender perspective le- lender perspective, or as a borrower. And for example, you, you could specialize, we mentioned earlier on the, on the podcast, but you could become, you know, a very specialized sneaker lender as an example. Um, and although you, you understand that um, the liquidity in those assets from time to time might be a little bit spotty, but you are still comfortable and confident of taking on that inventory risk because you're a market specialist in that area. Yeah, yeah. And can you just talk like a little bit about sort of the size of the NFT market? So if you compare, you know, NFT with, let's say, liquid tokens, and I guess there's a whole bunch of different dimensions that one could look at, you know, I don't know, the total market cap or like trading volume or you know, to the, le- the size of the lending market and, and maybe the size of the lending market, you know, relative to the total market cap. I'm curious, like, what are some of the things that stand out to you the most? Yeah, so maybe I I'll, can talk a little bit about penetration. Maybe you can talk a little bit about more, like, overall size of the market. Um, so if you look at art lending, for example, in the traditional world, um, it's like $1.4 trillion asset class. It's got a roughly 15% penetration. So 15% of that $1.4 trillion is being held in collateral as a loan, mainly with banks or, and galleries. And if you're looking at penetration in the NFT space, it's probably sub 2% at the moment. Uh, you know, it was a little bit higher, I think, at the peak of the, of the, the bull run, but it's, it's dropped a little bit now. Um, there's a roughly hundred million dollars in outstanding debt across all protocols at the moment uh, for uh, NFT lending. Uh, but really, you know, kind of, I think of this as similar to where DeFi was pre-DeFi summer. There was kind of, you know, these protocols. Um, they'd kind of built the core product. They found some product market fit with a core set of users who are very deep into the space, uh, and they kind of drive. You know, there's quite a, there's quite a lot of concentration around a few big holders, quite a lot of concentration around a few big lenders. 
uh, and we're gonna we predict that in the next bull cycle you're gonna see that you know expand and, and explode quite significantly because um, now you're gonna have this infrastructure and multiple options to to um, cater to different types of users there. Uh, so so that's kind of the overall lending market size. I mean, if you can look, if you think about the overall market, you know, fifty six percent of the estimated value in the stock market are is intangible assets. A lot of them that are non fungible, right? So, if you're looking at the traditional world and the total value of all items in the world, most of that value is actually non fungible. So, buildings, um, super tankers, your car is non fungible. So. Um, so, so I think the total addressable market of what's eventually going to be tokenized and represented as non-fungible is as big or even bigger potentially than the ERC-20 tw or the, the fungible market, uh, but we're still very, very early in that uh, adoption cycle. Yeah, and just even to add there some additional stats as well, just to, to give you a sense, like you look at the global equities market, it's about 120 trillion, global real estate is 320 um, global debt markets 300 so you know roughly between all of those if you kind of get uh you know roughly even at like two percent penetration there you begin to actually eclipse the size of the erc20 market in and of itself um and maybe in the near term two percent is a little bit on the high side but you know i can easily see in the next maybe let's call it two to four years like half a half a percent of, of some of those assets starting to come on chain um, because we are sp speaking to a lot of the protocols behind, you know, that are that are actually actually doing this, and you know, it's happening at a lot faster pace than people I think realize. W one thing I'm curious about. So I was like looking at some of the stats, and I mean, first of all, what, what stood out to me was that like you know, actually, Nifty Fi's stats look like pretty good. Right, where okay, it's down a bit, but not that much, right? From like the sort of peak. Uh, and then, you know, there was also like a stat for, um, so yeah, I mean, there, there you felt like, well, that probably looks better than most like DeFi uh, charts, right? For like DeFi protocols. But then when there was also the thing where you had the like the other lending competitors. And then you have basically like Blur coming in like a few months ago and just now having on these charts, at least if it's correct, like something like 90% you know, of the loan volume. I'm curious, can you talk a bit like what happened there? Is that correct? Like what's what's going on and what, what did Blur do? Yeah, yeah. So, so I think important thing to, for some reason, Volume really has been the metric that a lot of people look at in the NFT uh, lending space, which doesn't really make any sense, right? And if you're looking at um, DeFi lending protocols, you're not looking at daily volume. What you're actually looking at is TVL, right? So how much um, data is collateralized in the, in the protocol. And that's very much um, a factor of two things. It's both your volume and your duration. Uh, and and so what we're seeing in Blend is if you compare them to um, so Blend is the Blur lending um, uh, offering that they've got. So if you compare their durations to the peer-to-peer -peer protocols, you know, so our average duration is almost forty days. Um, the average duration for a Blend loan is zero point nine days, zero point nine four roughly. So they just have to do significantly more volume to keep the the outstanding debt. Um, so that's um, so that's one thing that's kind of it's very much skewed. So looking, yes, they do ninety percent of the volume, but they need to do six percent of the outstanding debt every single day just to stay in in the same place. So um, on the outstanding debt side, they're actually kind of more in line with everybody else, kind of in the eighteen to twenty million um, dollars at the moment. That makes perfect sense. Yeah, yeah, no, and I agree. I agree with your reasoning. That seems like a more relevant metric for a protocol like that. Exactly, and then I mean the other thing that's also happening um, there with with Blur and Blend is that there's very strong token incentives at the moment that that are um, going on, uh, and uh, just because of the way the incentive structure is uh, the incentive structure is uh, set up, uh, taking out a loan as part of your process if you're trying to maximize the number of points that you, you Blur points that you're getting as part of a specific um, uh, trade. 
uh, taking out a loan on an asset that you bought in a bid and then selling it out of the loan contract actually gives you extra points because you get bonus points for taking out a loan uh, and selling assets out of the loan contract means you bypass royalties. So it's actually the cheapest way to, to sell an asset. So you'll see a lot of the blend volume is is really a function of the spot volume. So the more people are kind of getting assets uh, hit on bids, the more likely they are to take out a loan. Uh, and it's just part of that um, kind of um, optimization loop that people are using. Well, that royalties thing is interesting. Does that uh, does that have some applicability as well in the Niftyfy case? Like let's say in case someone's loan gets liquidated, then that then royalties are due for the creator? Yeah, at the moment, there the, the aren't royalties being paid out um, on a liquidation uh, just because it's quite difficult to have a standardized um, on-chain way to know exactly what those royalties are. So, you know, our things all get settled as part of the actual um, loan smart contract. Uh, but, you know, so we're very open to adding those in uh, once there is a, like a fully on-chain way to actually determine what the royalties are for a specific project. And then typically at the end, uh, of a loan, if it's been liquidated, the lender will go to one of the various marketplaces and sell it there um, and determine at that moment in time whether they would like to or not pay the royalties at, at that moment. Because paying royalties is something that sort of like de facto is mostly optional or how does it work? Pretty much, you know, there's there's not an easy way for protocol for projects to enforce this at the smart contract level. Um, we've seen a number of projects essentially migrating their um, the ESC 721 contracts to allow them to block um, marketplaces that um, bypass the, the actual royalty payments. So uh, we'll see where that kind of ends up. You know, it's it's quite a it's a bit of a uh, you know game theory um, set up there where you kind of asset producers are trying to maximize their royalties while platforms are trying to, you know, maximize volume. So the cheaper the tr the cost of the transaction, the more likely you are to take, to take that volume. Um, I think you probably see, you know, these real world assets platforms, I suspect will probably have a little bit more power to enforce royalties, you know, because because they actually own the physical asset, you know, they can just say, well, you can't redeem this asset until you've pay, paid the royalties on that, um, that are actually due. So, so I think that they've got a stronger um, moat in terms of uh, royalties as being a um, value stream for them. Uh, uh, and this is another reason I think a lot of the projects that raised money kind of during the last big bull run, a lot of them were really like relying on royalties to, to kind of be their ongoing um, uh, cash flow and, and uh, revenue. And that's largely evaporated over the last you know, six months or so. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I guess it was always something that was kind of like, well, can you really enforce that, right? And uh, it's interesting how quickly that seems to have sort of moved to the you know, I guess equilibrium of everyone ignores the royalties. Exactly. Yeah. I, like I think it's a, it's an area that's a big double-edged sword in that for creators, uh, the blockchain offers you a new avenue to access uh, consumers, customers, which, you know, from which you can, you can generate revenue. But on the other side of that, one of the great aspects of uh, Ethereum in particular is the permissionlessness of it so that you can create essentially ways around um you know giving creators their their dues essentially so um definitely a double-edged sword there can you talk a little bit about this the uh, maybe comparing blend and niftyfy or maybe are there like what are the other kind of nft lending protocols doing and what are kind of the main dimensions on which they differ yeah so i think um yeah, so thinking about peer-to-peer -peer versus peer-to-pool, that's like a little bit more on the technical level. Um, if you're looking at it from an end-user perspective, I think the big distinction there at the moment is, is it fixed duration or variable duration and fixed interest versus variable interest? Uh, and that just, you know, fixed duration, um, fixed interest is just much more interesting for a, for a specific user cohort. So typically people who have, longer term views who are collecting these assets because they want to collect them 
uh, and they actually want to hold them over the long run. Uh, and then there's a separate cohort, which is much more trader focused to work like much shorter term deals, trying to maximize yield over, you know, 48 to, you know, 72 hours, something like that. Uh, and those types of um, asset owners really um, prefer variable duration, variable interest, because they can come in and out of those loans uh, in, a, in a shorter period of time. Um, and then, you know, then I think the other thing, which is a little bit less of an issue right now, uh, which was, but more of an issue in the uh, in the past, and I think will become an issue again, um, is can you actually use this asset while it's being used um, locked up in an actual uh, loan, right? So at the peak of the bull run, you would have lots of airdrops and events, and, you know, you had to sign into this discord with your board ape so that you can get access to this other thing that then gives you a mint or this other thing so you know you wanted to be able to use the asset while it's in escrow so um, typically the um, it's easier to do that in peer-to-peer -peer versus peer-to-pool um, because assets are all like pooled into like, a big bucket together um, but i think that is a, the, the big uh, dis uh, differentiator right now um, and then and I think over time, as these assets become more and more, have more of a history, you know, people are more willing to lend over the, on them over the long run. You know, I think features that really drive longer duration um, are going to become more important over, uh, over the next six to 12 months. I'm actually curious to ask about that. So, yeah, like using the NFT while it's being used, uh, let's say on Nifify as collateral, does that, like, how does that work? So does it depend on the particular NFTs? And Yeah, so that becomes a little bit more tricky because um, you, it, you, you start running into this issue where um, each NFT has some idiosyncrasies on how you allow, how you can use them, what affects their value, all those kind of things. Um, but so our solution to that is um, it it's, should be going live in the next few months. Uh, we've got an integration with uh, Gnosis Safe. Uh, and what that allows us to do is at the moment, what happens is we have a single escrow contract that all assets go into. Uh, so... Instead of doing that, what we will allow users to do in the future is you mint a new Niftify um, safe, uh, which is just a Gnosis safe where you, as well as the Niftify protocol, are signers on that actual um, on that safe. And then essentially what we do is we block transfer of that asset during the loan period. So um, it goes into the, the safe. Um, and then the safe in combination with our actual protocol just says this asset is not transferable. So it blocks any transfer uh, methods uh, on that asset for the duration of the loan. As soon as the loan is finished, that transfer gets um, unlocked again. But everything else you can still do. So you can, you know, you can still use that safe to connect to a Discord um, using um, Wallet Connect. And, you know, you can connect to any application that that uses that asset and use it as is in the game, as long as the transaction doesn't result in a change of ownership of that asset at the end of it. We'll just refer to any transaction that um, that does that. Yeah, that sounds like an elegant uh, solution. Yeah, yeah, it's a little bit more complicated and tricky than just kind of building a like a vault that's like protocol specific. Um, but, you know, I think that the right solution there is to plug into the you know, infrastructure that has proven itself to be the, a core part of Web3, really. Um, and, you know, we don't then need to, you know, as account abstraction gets added onto Gnosis Safe and they add additional features, you know, you get all of that for free um, just by using that as your um, escrow wallet inside Niftify. And and then do you have to also take into account, I think you mentioned it before a little bit, like, oh, what if there are like other things that somebody could do with an NFT that maybe, I don't know. Changes their value. Changes. Damage the value. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, I think that that becomes really difficult to handle in a generic way, right? So, so I think that there's always going to be some, you know, doing these kinds of loans in these like segregated escrows, what, we, what we're calling it really. Um, you know, for art, 99.9% .9 of the time, it's going to be fine. For gaming assets, maybe not, right? So I'll give you a good example of this is, um, say you've got a crypto kitty. Uh, a crypto kitty, a virgin crypto kitty is more valuable than a crypto kitty that's been bred. 
Now, that doesn't change ownership, but that's purely based on the internal mechanics of the game and the community that people value virgin crypto kitties more than they do uh, non-virgin ones. Now, that's really difficult for any third-party platform to go write a set of rules for that make that acceptable for every single possible um, asset out there. So, so I do think that there's always going to be some customization. You know, one of the big things we are doing as we kind of keep evolving the pro- protocol is finding hooks and places where people might want to inject some custom logic into um, into the process. You know, so basically being able to say, well, when we lock a crypto kitty in this um, in the the escrow smart contract, there's an extra set of validation that you need to do to make sure that the actual transactions um, can go through. Obviously, there's there's some gas cost um, implications there, but I think over the long run, in general, this is a problem that you have much more with NFTs than you do with ERC twenties because um, most ERC twenties basically operate in the same way. You know, they don't have built in logic and built in you know properties that might change as part of in usage inside of another protocol. Whereas because an NFT can really be anything, it's just a unique digital ownable thing. It can really be anything. So uh, in some scenarios, it's harder to have very generic pieces of um, uh, of infrastructure built for them. And what does the what does the Nictify roadmap look like? What are what's next for you guys to build? Yeah, so so what I uh, mentioned earlier, you know, duration I think becomes really important. So you know, so dif- different features that really make it easier for um, both borrowers and lenders to take more risk over longer duration. Uh, so um, you know, things along the, that lines are things like refinancing, uh, interest in, um, only loans, where at least the the, the lender is getting in- interest payments uh, during the actual loan period. Um, you know, potentially early repayment of loans so that you can take out a long loan, but uh, you know, can repay earlier. There's no so safe that we that we spoke about. Uh, you know, so uh, and then a number of different things that just make it more efficient for lenders to deploy capital. So um, you know, at the moment we've got you can make offers on individual assets, you can make offers on a, like a whole collection, and then we've got API um, integrations like Storm said, uh, where you can kind of um, watch our order book and make um, these individual offers. But just expanding that and kind of making it easier for less technical people to compete with what the bots guys can do making the collection offers more powerful being able to limit it to specific ranges um, you know those kind of things and so where are the um, where are the interest rate levels at the moment varies a lot depending on the assets so storm spends day in day out dealing with these things maybe he's got a, a, a better view there yeah abso- absolutely um, I suppose like as a first concept, it's been fascinating to watch even over the last, uh, let's call it six to 12 months, rates just continuing to fall uh, across the board. Um, and that's really a function of, there's quite a lot of lenders who are actively involved in the space and like really um, actively deploying capital against um, NFT loans. And so as a result, the more lenders, more competition, it's fantastic for borrowers because they're essentially competing um, to undercut each other to secure these loans from borrowers. So, you know, where are rates more specifically? Um, so, probably for something like a, a CryptoPunk, and maybe I can go through kind of some of the the um, more major collections that are um, active on the platform. Something like a CryptoPunk, as an example, if you wanted to get a thirty day loan, uh, you could secure somewhere in the range of eighty to ninety percent loan to value at a rate of in the range of let's call it eight to ten percent APR. Um, and actually similarly for one year duration loans against CryptoPunks, you could probably look at somewhere in the range of 70 to 80 percent loan to value, maybe a little bit higher on the APR side, let's call it 10 to 12 percent. Um, and again that's for for a one year loan. So probably you know alongside punks, there are two other, you know, what we term like the really true um, blue chip collections like we're we're lucky we have a you know very unique lens through which we see the nft market is like the nft credit markets um 
And so we really get to see like what collections are being underwritten or underscored as like the true blue chips because it has the lenders like offering the lowest rates for the for the longest terms. And so alongside punks, you also have chromy squiggles by, of course, the legend that is Snowfro, and then autoglyphs as well in early uh, Larva Labs uh, gener- generative art projects. So they're probably your main three uh, lowest, uh, highest LTV and also lowest L- um, APR collections. And then for other collections, more, let's call it, um, you know, other kind of profile pictures that, that you might classically know. Um, Apes, for example, is going to be a little bit higher on the on the APR side, maybe in the range of 15%, maybe looking at something like a 70% LTV. Um, and then as you m- migrate across like the risk spectrum, let's call it, so the lesser known projects, you probably get up to maybe in the range of 20 to 40% APR, and the typical durations there are around 30 days. So the, the classic duration on, on the platform is 30 days. And I would actually maybe some of the best art blocks curated collections you're probably getting similar rates to um snow, uh, the squiggles and autoglyphs right maybe slightly slightly higher or maybe slightly lower ltv just because they're not quite as liquid but you know things like fidenzas or ringers um you know those those kind of top tier art projects are also getting um rates kind of in that in that same range yeah that's a great point there's a very strong bid on on the kind of uh, top tier art blocks across the board, and actually just generally art blocks more generally uh, too. So the the kind of full collections of, of art blocks there. Yeah, thanks so much. That was very helpful. This is like a kind of related topic. I wanted to talk a little bit about. Uh, so you know, Stephen, you know, you mentioned in the beginning, right? You you were an artist, and that you you know did some work around generative art. I'm like wondering also, like zooming out a little bit. You know what's the what's the state of the NFT art market, and what do you feel are the most interesting and cool things happening? Yeah, so I think broadly you have two big groups. Um, so it would be the fully on-chain generative art, and then more the one-of-one art, uh, where it's um, is not fully generated on chain. You know, the artist produces some kind of digital image that they then associate with an actual NFT versus the fully on chain generative art, which is you know autoglyphs, art blocks, and you know there's a few other protocols that are that are doing that now. And these assets essentially, the image itself is not stored on chain. What's stored on chain is an algorithm that, given a specific hash can ge- regenerate that image uh, at any resolution. So so those are kind of the two broad groups, I would say, in the on-chain um, uh, art side of things. Uh, the generative pieces are typically part of a collection. So, you know, there are 512 autoglyphs. Uh, you know, there's... Um, so, so there's more of those assets. So they typically have a larger collector base which makes them a little bit more liquid. So they trade a little bit more often. So it's easier to know what the price is. If you do get a default, you, it's easier to, to, um, to sell those items again. So, so those are kind of the two broad cut categories there. I think both of them have found strong product market fits, you know, still maybe you can talk about some, some big sales and prices and how they've held up in the, um, in the recent market. Yeah, ex- look, exactly. So. I think it's been very interesting as the profile picture market uh, across the board has kind of been relatively weak and, and the price has, has lowered, let's call it over the last six, six to nine months, where you look at the higher end of the art blocks market in particular, it's actually remained very, very solid and stable and in some pockets has increased significantly. Um, I think when you look at something like the recent uh, goose sale at Sotheby's for $6.2 million. I mean, this is a category which is here to stay. You know, it's it's known um, that there are some ultra high net worths and high net worths now starting to dabble in the market and build their collection in the generative art space. Um, so I think it's a category that becomes of increasing interest to the traditional art world. And then as a result, you know, um, there kind of are, are these well-established credit markets which exist alongside them as well, which actually help to support um, the prices of those assets as well. Because when you are seeking liquidity against the assets, 
instead of previously your only option was either to sell the asset, whereas actually now you have two options. You can sell the asset and or take a loan against it, which is actually a very uh, typical approach with art collectors in the traditional art world. Yeah, and I think like another way to think of that a, a little bit is to say is to say, you know, profile pictures at thirty ETH are very expensive for a new kind of asset that still needs to find like exactly where it's deriving its value from. Whereas you know, so there was a recent autoglyph sale for two hundred ether. That's very cheap for one of the well, basically the first example of a new category in uh, modern art right so so there's and, and then a lot of these ultra high net worth individuals that storm was talking about uh they aren't necessarily crypto native they own traditional artworks uh and and they're buying in dollars so you know when these asset prices for these nft um art um uh, assets are dropping in ether terms at some point these collectors are looking at them and like, well, you know, in dollar terms, that's actually just really cheap for what I'm buying here. And, and that's kind of why I think you see this floor almost in the dollar price of some of these assets. And as Ethereum fluctuates, it just doesn't drop below that specific floor because there's a set of buyers that are just saying, okay, 30 grand or 50 grand for a for a crypto punk is actually cheap. So whenever they drop below, below that price in USD terms, I'll just buy them. And what's the what is the impact of AI on all of this? So, AI art as a category itself, um, I think, is actually quite fascinating, and it's one that I'm actually very passionate about. Um, probably one of my favorite collections that's out there, if not my favorite, are the Lost Robbies by Robbie Barrett. Uh, fascinating story behind them, um, and I mean. It's very interesting to see whenever one of these trades, uh, typically they range in the, let's call it 175 ETH to 300 ETH range of, of uh, trade prices. It's very interesting to see a very visceral reaction of people on Twitter um, about how, you know, some people just consider it completely, uh, you know, disgusting or they, they just don't, don't get it. And I think when you look at pieces of art and, and it actually has that like emotive uh, capacity, you're probably looking at it, what is a quite a powerful piece of art. Um, so I think as a, as a category, it's fascinating. Again, in some ways, it's similar to emergence of generative art, where you're marrying um, the medium of the blockchain with art. I think it's very interesting here. This is the new dawn of you're marrying a medium of AI, the new emergent category with art as well. And I think as you uh, transverse the art history timeline, you know, in, in many years time, th they will actually be two seminal moments in, in art, art history being, uh, you know, blockchain based art and AI based art as well. Yeah, exactly. And I think also the, the blockchain based art and AI based art feed into each other in a way, because one of the biggest reasons, you know, it's generative art and digital art has been around for quite a long time. They just, they just never really, really hard to actually as a museum or as a collector to buy them right like what are you actually buying you know um are you buying a tv that's representing these these images or are you buying a printout of the image but you can print as many as you want there uh and and i think if you didn't have the blockchain ai art would probably be less interesting because I, I think it would be AI graphics then as opposed to AI art because you can't say that this is an original and this is the one that I'm actually actually selling. So, um, you know, this is another reason why I think on-chain art as a category is just going to keep growing because there's going to be new things you can do, you know, like, you know, new technologies come out, um, but it's now just a new medium in the same way that you've got painting and sculpting um, and performance art, now you've got um, on-chain art as well. I think when you look as well, like the Rafik Anadol piece that's in the MoMA in New York at the moment, I mean, I saw it in person, it's AI generated, absolutely fascinating, absolutely captivating. And you look at the people sat there for 20, 30 minutes at a time, just taking it in, which just simply doesn't happen with 
um, traditional, you know, painting medium, for example, that that existed to date. So I think you know we live in this attention economy, and these artworks, as an example, a generative artwork, as you watch your, watch it render in, is part of the the fascinating engagement that you have with that work. In the same way, you know, uh, the Rafik piece is just it's utterly captivating, and it's taking art, I think, to a whole whole new level. Cool. No, I really appreciate it. I mean, maybe just a final question here. So, you know, you talked in the beginning, we talked quite a bit about, you know, different categories of NFTs, real world assets, and you know how like so broad when it came to the actual, you know, NFT lending market. Is is that still kind of all focused on some of these art and PFP type things and hasn't yet reached to, you know, all these new types of NFTs? Yeah, so I think there aren't that many assets yet that are real world assets that are being represented. Uh, like like Storm said, we're speaking to a lot of people at the moment, and and uh, you know what happened in this last bull run is exactly what you'd expect: the the fully native crypto assets that are you know don't require high transactions through, but you know don't require. Um, a, a lot of speed and, and um, uh, transaction capacity are the ones that found product market fit. So art, really, right? Uh, and some of these PFPs. So you kind of saw them taking off and then you saw all of this infrastructure being built out. So, you know, um, like we mentioned, perps, lending, um, where you've got indexes, you've got fractionalization, you've got 24-hour marketplaces. So now all of this infrastructure has been built uh, and a lot of teams saw the potential there and, uh, and then started, r- raised a bunch of money and now started building out the infrastructure needed to bring more of these uh, real world assets on chain. Uh, and so we started seeing some loans um, on, on these assets, you know, so um, uh, we've done some loans on some empty, empty land, uh, you know, there's been some loans on Rolexes, uh, you know, so, so these things are starting to happen. But there's just quite a f- there's just not that many assets yet um, that are uh, that have been pulled on chain. As those grow, uh, you know the ones that we really see taking off initially are the ones that we said that are more collectible, like um, because there's a big overlap in the user base. There's a, a the overlap in how they trade. There's an overlap in how you price them. They're all e- pretty ill- illiquid. So the characteristics of those assets are quite similar. I suspect once they come on chain, those assets actually will be better collateral than most NFTs just because um, the thing that's new is how you represent the asset, but the asset itself has got a much longer trading history than uh, what you know the new crop of crypto native NFTs uh, have. So, so you'll much quicker see higher LTV, lower APR, longer duration loans for these assets. Uh, and I also think that there's quite a lot of collectors who are sitting on quite a lot of value that they just can't access at the moment because if you've got a fifty thousand dollar watch, it's actually quite hard to get a loan from a bank on that. You know, if you've got a fifty million dollar painting, sure you can do that. So if you've got a ten million dollar super rare watch, you're sure banks will kind of go through the the effort of actually giving you a loan. But there's a huge amount of value in the you know twenty to a hundred thousand dollar range that just basically be, sit there at the moment. So um, the the benefit of actually bringing these things on chain purely as a way to to collateralize it uh, really becomes um, quite interesting. I think broadly, you know, alongside the tokenized collectibles, there it's probably um, four main categories of of real world assets. One of which, as mentioned, is the tokenized collectibles. You probably will start to have tokenized equity and um, token positions, essentially. So, um, from classic crypto investments, so that, that I think they will start to look quite interesting. A lot of other tokenized financial assets, so bonds, um, stocks, items like that. And then you lastly also have tokenized real estate and real assets. But of course, the regulatory friction that comes with all of those items is much more significant than tokenizing a comic or a trading card or a watch, as an example. Um, so I think those, but with that being said, once we do get that regulatory unlock, you start to then get like a very material addressable market 
um, of real world assets on chain and accordingly then a material credit market that sits alongside it. Cool. Well, thanks so much, uh, guys, both for coming on. I think this is a really great uh, overview of like NFT finance and lending. And, you know, I think it makes a lot of sense, right? Just uh, the enormous thing that's ahead of us. So I'm excited to see how that's going to develop and how these markets are going to evolve. And so thanks so much for, for joining us. Yeah, yeah, we're excited. We're in, you know, we're in it for the long run. Um, yeah, could we say sometimes where, there, where there's value, there's finance, right? So, you know, as the, the value of things represented by NFTs increases, the, the size of the, the financial ecosystem around, they will just grow um, uh, in accordance.